let's take a moment and look at this thing called automatic responses. Because we're learning some things these days about what this automatic response is all about. And we've known about you know, the fight or flight theory for probably 100 years. Um, and it's really imprinted our understanding of uh, responses to high stress and to trauma. But we're fine-tuning some of our understanding about it these days. So I want to spend a minute or so on it. Because this thing that happens when the brain senses trauma, again, whatever that means, something in a nanosecond occurs automatically. It's an involuntary response. So just to tell you what part of the brain we're looking at, I have this little sort of flow chart. The central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system, has multiple branches. When we say that trauma triggers an automatic involuntary response, we mean that it activates this autonomic nervous system. It is autonomic because it is automatic, and it is always there, ready to respond. It's always working to some extent, but it goes into high gear when trauma is unfolding. And the two main parts of it are the sympathetic nervous system, which is often thought of as the, um, you know, the, act, the turning on part, the, the part that turns on all of our responses. And the parasympathetic part, which is uh, the turning off part. Now, when we're going through our daily life and we are whole beings, these two parts are humming in the background. The sympathetic nervous system is turning things on and just enough, though. And the parasympathetic is turning them off at just enough, though. I mean, you're sitting here in this room, and right now your sympathetic system is working to keep you at a certain level of alertness. You know, yet you're not jumping up and down on the tables, you know, and uh, throwing things around the room. You're keeping just the right level of alertness. Your parasympathetic system is keeping you sort of sitting in that chair, you know, uh, turning and oriented in the right direction and listening to what's being said. And you're flowing, sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic. And in order to function, we have to be good at keeping those things in balance. It's as if we've got one foot on the gas and the other foot on the brake, and we're deciding how much of each to use all the time. When we are whole and we are balanced and we are functioning, we're really good at that brake and that accelerator action. Right? Like nobody's head has fallen down to the table yet, although there's a tendency to it. And just as that happens, the sympathetic system kicks in and warns you, oh, straighten up. OK, look alert. Pretend you're listening. Something. <laughs> right? but, then if, but then you are a little bit getting tired. So your body is saying, to, to, in order to stay alert, shift your position. Move around in the chair a little bit. And so you're getting these multiple on-off signals all the time. When a traumatic reaction happens, um, things change. So I want to go to this next little diagram here. And I want to say I've just been describing how we function mostly in life as healthy, balanced people. We have this certain range of up and downness to our every moment. Our attention, our energy, our heart rate, our digestive processes, are all going in this up and down uh, motion. And in fact, the healthier you are, the wider the window of this up and downness you have. You have a wider window of tolerance, we say. Right? There's not, not everybody could come in and sit in this room and listen to this brilliant lecture like this, right? <laughs> But you're here, you're doing it, because you have a certain wide window of tolerance. And you can say no to sort of lower urges. You might feel like taking out a cigarette and lighting up, right? But you don't do that. 
your window of tolerance allows you to tolerate more discomfort and to postpone gratification because you have this healthiness to you. All right? Now, when we're functioning in here, we are most uh, optimal in being able to respond to things. We can think more clearly, we remember more things, we can organize, plan, execute. We're really on a roll when we're in that, in that moment. But now, when this traumatic moment happens, somewhere here, we used to think of, you know, we automatically go into a sympathetic nervous system response of fight or flight, but that's not what happens to us whole beings who have these wide windows of tolerance. What happens is the parasympathetic system kicks in first when there's signs of danger and even signs of trauma. We go into a, what's called social engagement. We use our social self and our social skills to get through these moments. Right? If they succeed, well, all well and good. Someone's about to jack your car and you start talking to them and maybe even beg them and you tell them about, you know, you've got kids at home and, you, and the person somehow, because you delayed them or whatever, they, they walk away. You use your social engagement to put off that threat. That's a parasympathetic response. You didn't immediately punch the guy, right? In fact, you probably sized up that punching the guy would not be in your best interest. You probably also sized up that trying to run away from him was not going to work. So you were able to stay in the social engagement period where you tried your best to put this thing off. If that fails, if that guy doesn't listen to your requests and your pleas, you now trigger the sympathetic response. Right? That happens automatically. Your system just breaks down in that moment of social engagement failure and you go into that sympathetic fight or flight response. And again, even in that fight or flight response, there's some decisions being made. If you think you can beat up the guy, you fight him. If you think you can run faster than him, you run. So there's still some choices in there. But you're in automatic zone now. You're not sitting there saying, I wonder what I should try next. Oh my, this guy is about to hit me over the head and steal my car. I wonder what my options are. You're not doing that. You're in some automatic, they would say, primitive mode of survival. And your brain, nervous system, body, emotion, social self is responding to keep you safe. Now, if this fails, the fight or flight fails, another branch of the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, and one can go into the freeze mode down here. All right? Now, often that's a last resort. Right? The person, not going to fight, not going to run, but they go almost like catatonic. In fact, in the animal kingdom, the animal plays dead so convincingly that the predator loses interest and runs off. That parasympathetic freeze mode is a powerful last resort. And the reason it's a kind of a last resort is that it can get so powerful and so deep that the person loses consciousness, can even stop breathing, their heart could stop beating, and they can die. So died from fright kind of thing, that's what would happen. Didn't, wasn't the first thing that happened. Social engagement happens. Sympathetic fight or flight happens. All that fails down into that parasympathetic mode. So this has some ramifications, not just for those poor guys out there being traumatized, but for us as workers. Because we're wanting to stay in this optimal zone. We're wanting to keep ourselves there in that place of a wide window of tolerance. 
Now, the way you reinforce that wide window of tolerance is many ways, right? You're, you're getting some training, you're getting peer support, you're learning some skills, you've got some tools, you've got a, a position that says you're you know, empowered to do this. There's a lot of ways you're reinforcing that wide window of tolerance. You walk onto that possibly traumatizing to you scene, and you can maintain social engagement. You go in there and you talk and you organize and you work it and you plan and you don't get reactive and you say, why don't we all sit down and talk about this? Why don't we have a circle? Why don't we find out if anybody needs medical attention? Who needs uh, uh, you know, care and uh, living arrangements? You use that social engagement self to do your work. Problem is, sometimes, sometimes, because you're having to function at these thresholds, at those border crossings, you're having to hang in there so much of the time, there could be, instead of a strengthening of those boundaries, an erosion of some of them, such that it might be possible for some subsequent less awful thing to put you over the edge, right? What happens is your tolerance diminishes. Your, your window shrinks a bit so that you reach your threshold sooner, right? That's one of the signs of burnout. Your threshold or lowering, that window is narrowing. You find yourself leaking over into that trauma response while you're doing your work. Either you get aggressive in your work, you're in that sympathetic mode, you're agitated, you're irritated. It's okay if you're the boss. You know? <laughs> or maybe you go into the freeze mode where you start numbing out. You start shutting down your feelings. You start distancing yourself from the pain of the people around you, including your colleagues. Right? All signs that as well as you've been doing in that window of tolerance, things are starting to deteriorate. That usually calls for a break. People generally need a break from the action to get that window wider and to get those thresholds higher and wider. So, if you're a person who's unfortunate enough to have had multiple traumas in life. And as Dave said earlier, that Billy looked like he had complex trauma. He had layers of lifetime trauma. That has cumulative effects, right? And the cumulative effects are that these parts start showing up what we call symptoms, right? People start looking ill. Right? Billy is already getting diagnosed at a young age as ADHD. Next year they'll say he has a conduct disorder. The year after that they'll say he's got a personality disorder. Soon they'll say he's got an antisocial personality disorder and the treatment of choice is what? Prison. <laughs> right? That's where they end up. So what's happening is that that fragmentation, that brokenness, is starting to trigger dysfunctional patterns so that the mind is not working clearly. And so the mind is starting to think um, a lot about self-blame, a lot about blaming others. The mind is distracting one's own assessment and putting it off track. Person can get stuck in self-blame or they can get stuck in blaming others, right? How do you get them back? It's hard to get them back just by using logic and trying to talk to them about it because they're already in this fractured state. So it's a slower process to convince them that A, it wasn't their fault, or B, it's not everybody else's fault, right? Also, the mind can start becoming quite um, focused on hopelessness. And hopelessness starts 
generalizing in a person's life. How many times are you working with clients where they really, no matter how good your idea seems, they can't seem to believe that it will help. They'll reject the idea for one reason or another. How many times can they not see themselves really as even taking that step? Because they feel they have concluded that that's not possible for them. Right? So mental derailment takes place in which people come up with erroneous conclusions based on faulty data. But then emotionally, they also start showing symptomatology. A person who's had multiple trauma, and as we could sense even with Billy here today, a sadness is going to begin to engulf them. Right? The energy of life is starting to drain out. The clouds are moving in and the darkness is settling and there's a feeling of heaviness. And that darkness ultimately can become clinical depression. Right? So the emotion can be you know, quite, quite severely depressed. Or the emotion could be anger. Right? And anger generally is a, is a mask. Right? That under anger, there's often lots of fear, lots of sadness, lots of aloneness. Right? Hard to get past that because the anger is such a convincing facade. People's uh, very demeanor looks angry. Their behaviors reflect lots of anger. And we as helpers, we have to step back from that a moment and say, what's underneath that anger? If I keep trying to address the anger, Billy should go to anger management workshops. Well, that may be something he could use somewhere along the way, but how are we going to get to that underlying stuff? We're not going to just put a Band-Aid on them, send them home. And then, of course, uh, we already mentioned the body. With trauma in people's lives, the one thing that in the long run we see is compromised immune responses. Whatever that growing list today of immune system uh, problems, uh, trauma will compromise the immune system because the very neurochemistry that you need to have a healthy immune system gets upset during a traumatic experience, gets physiologically and neurochemically upset. So immune responses. So people get sick after trauma. People get physically ill and illnesses in their life following repetitive trauma. Right? It's the thing that happens. And when you're all over the place like that within yourself, your social relationships are also haywire. You're having multiple failed social relationships, except where someone like Billy finds a whole group of kids who look just like this. And they find each other, you know, and they reinforce each other um, and their ideas of solutions, how to, how to feel better, how to get on top. Now, one of the problems we have is that if traumatic experiences break people down in these multiple dimensions, why is it that mostly what we do is to relate to their mind, right? We spend so much time thinking about mental interventions with them, right? It's about teaching, it's about awareness, it's about education, information, you know, getting them to talk about it. Uh, very, very mental, right? It's not the old way of medicine, but it's certainly the new way. When in fact, this person, we should be looking at and we should be saying, how can we mobilize enough resources so that all of these areas are being addressed? Because if I can only do one part of it, I need to ask who could do this part, and who can do this part, and who can do this part. And often they are some separate folks. One of the reasons I like to use art, you know, we just did a little funny scribble stuff today, but I use art all the time in my work, is because it has a way of talking to all these parts. You give people a task to do, but you give them some colored 
crayons, you give them a blank piece of paper, and it's not just their mind that gets engaged, but their emotions get engaged, their body gets engaged, they have some fun with it, so their social, emotional stuff gets stirred. It's a multi-dimensional activity when what you're trying to do is feed all those parts so that this sense of meaning starts strengthening and can pull them together again. If we're just working with the mind to try to have the mind pull everything together, we're rather limited. If we're just working with a person's emotions or their social behaviors or their physical symptoms, well, they need help in all those, but to try to get just one of those to pull together all of it is very, very challenging. The one example I see of where people can take a sort of focused approach and do some trauma healing is folks who have the ability to work here, to work in that place we call the self, the soul, the spirit, the place of meaning. That seems to be the big payoff zone to be working in. As helpers, we don't have a lot of those tools. In some of our helping professions, we've even been told not to go there. Right? That's somebody else's domain. But in fact, a traumatized person who's had multiple traumas is wounded in that core place. And how do we nurture that? How do they connect with it, maybe never having been connected to it? How many times do guys go into prison and they find that somewhere? Right? And that seems to work for some of them, right? Somehow it pulls stuff together. Whatever we might think of it and however we might see it, it works for them. And if it's not, uh, if it's helping them more than harming them, it has to be supported. This is what happens to the poor person who's had multiple traumas. This will be Billy's story. And is his story already that he is so far out of the optimal zone. There are moments maybe when he's in that optimal zone and can function somewhat in there, but most of his day and most of his life, he's on a roller coaster. And things are triggering him into that hyper state or into that hypo state. And sometimes both of those states are there at the same time. Right? He's very, very active and very, very doing something. He's in there breaking into homes or shoplifting in stores, and he's numb while he's doing it. Right? And afterwards, we sit down and we say to him, well, why did you do that? He says, I don't know. Right? Well, maybe that's the right answer. Right? If he was in living in this zone, it's very possible that he looked very engaged in what he was doing and was very absent from what he was doing. And I don't mean that as, as an excuse, but as an explanation for some of what we hear and some of what we see as we're trying to help folks make sense of, of what they did and what, what happened to them. So when you're, Billy is in this way of life now, this becomes his new normal. Right? He doesn't want to have a nice little quiet life anymore. You know, he needs some sort of life that's going to have some bit of excitement and doesn't have horrific crashes. How do we help him find that? Hopefully, each of us have some ways that we can leave this optimal zone every now and again and have some highs, right? Have some rushes. My daughter jumps out of perfectly good airplanes. You know, to, I don't know why she does that. It never occurred to me to do that, but you know, that's her rush. But the thing about those kinds of rushes, afterwards, she doesn't crash into depression and numbness. She comes down for a soft landing, so to speak, and feels back in that optimal zone. So each of us needs some way to do that, to get to that place. Billy doesn't have that. Billy only has the rushes and the crashes. And over the course of his life, he forgets the crash part. And he's focused on the rush part. He's chasing that rush in any way he can. And he's not realizing the damage and the harm and the destruction that it's doing in his life. So we say, 
and um, this is what Dave was alluding to earlier, this would be complex post-traumatic stress disorder where a person has multiple dysregulation in all of these domains, right? And um, when they're all dysfunctional, very difficult to go through life in any meaningful way. This is going to be the repeat offender, the person who relapses, because they're, in fact, um, thinking of this as normal, right? I said to one guy, what do you do for fun? He says, oh, on a well, Friday night, I'm probably going to you know, smoke a couple of joints before I go out. I hit a couple of bars. I got a whole bunch of bars and friends that I you know, know there. Uh, eventually, I'm going to score some other drugs, and it's going to get a little bit later, and I'm going to go hang out in some bars where I know the women are now hanging out, and they're kind of doing the same thing, and I'm going to hook up with one of them, and we're going to spend the night, and we're going to have a wild party together, drugs and sex and rock and roll. He says, what do you do for fun? <laughs> Oh, I stay home and watch DVDs and, you know, uh, hot, drink hot chocolate. <laughs> it becomes a real dilemma. How do we have any credibility with them? <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't... Well, wouldn't it be so nice if you just calmed down and you know, didn't get in so much trouble, you know? You're only hurting yourself, you know. You know? Oh, man, they look at us like, Boring, you know, <laughs> dead, something, right? So somehow, you know, this is the reason we take, in Aboriginal cultures, we take kids out on the land and we go hunting and fishing and trapping and hiking and, and setting up tents and doing survival stuff with them because this is the zone they live in. And we have to show them a way to live here and enjoy it in a life-affirming way while they're clean and sober and while they can learn a lot about themselves and they can bring that back home into their everyday life. Right? We're very handicapped when we have offices to work in. You know? it's, it's the least ideal way to work with trauma survivors. They need much more and hopefully we can help mobilize much more for them than just simply sitting around talking. So I wanted to say one more thing about this multiple trauma person. And um, eventually, that core place has been so assaulted in a person's life that they've had multiple tragedies, trauma after trauma. In some cases, there's no such thing as post-traumatic stress because there's no post for them, right? Just goes on and on and on. Um, and over the course of time, that place gets darker and darker and darker in them. And if you've seen folks like this, you know, it's as if there's something dead about them. When I show this picture to um, elders and medicine people in Aboriginal communities, they say, this would be our understanding of a person who harms children. Right? And when I ask them, why, why is that? And they say, well, their spirit is gone. And in harming young children, it's their attempt to take the spirit from that child, to dispirit that child. And as that child becomes more dispirited in some confused way, they have a sense that they're gaining more spirit from them. Right? That kind of made me think a lot about people that I've known. Right? And I say again, if that's where the hunger is, these are the very people who need much more of these meaning kinds of supports. Call it spiritual, call it religious, call it transpersonal, call them something big beyond the ordinary that gives their spirit <coughs> A wake-up call. And sometimes, you know, that's sitting in a circle, right? Where they've never quite had that experience in that moment where there's something unusual going on here and they don't really understand it maybe, but it's speaking to them in some deep way. Right? And so a lot of the approaches that we're using these days, I find they're going to that spiritual core. 
And we may not be naming it that and advertising it as such, but it helps me to think that that's what we're doing because they've been spirit wounded and now they need some spirit healing. So, I wanted to say that. We're going to uh, spend a few minutes on the brain. And unfortunately, you, you'll not be able to perform brain surgery after this little lecture. Um, but maybe we'll learn some things. And I want to tie together what we've been talking about so far about trauma with the brain. And again, it helps me to get a sense of what am I looking at when I see this person in front of me and they're saying and doing these odd things. And so the brain is so complex that we've just barely fathomed its real functioning. Uh, trillions and trillions of cells and uh, probably still growing for most of you. you know, I didn't see your 30s. There's still brain development. You're not a finished product yet. Right? So we, we have only metaphorical ways of talking about the brain these days and trying to make some sense of it. And we know that they're just metaphors. This is not you know, 100% accurate scientific way of talking about the brain. But it does ring true in um, helping us to understand it. So we have to break this brain down, as they started to do in the early 1980s, into three main parts. And I want to say some things about it, because it, it has relevance for our, our understanding trauma and healing. So the very first part of our brain to develop is that place in the very back, that clump of brain cells at the base of our skull with a medulla and the part that goes down into the spinal column and attaches to you know, our entire body. This part of the brain, as a matter of fact, during um, the nine months in the womb, that part of the brain develops 100%. So that the moment that the baby is born, this brain is fully online, ready to do what that baby needs done for survival. It's amazing, just in the nine months. It'll grow in volume, but its function is all there. This moment that cord is cut, it's ready to go. So what is it doing? Well, it's doing all of those automatic things that one needs to survive. It's regulating all of those automatic things. It's balancing them. So this is where we have that parasympathetic and that sympathetic stuff starting to be activated and deactivated in this part of the brain, which, because it's so basic to our survival, is referred to as the survivor brain. Right? So that's, that's part one. And the survivor brain, as we said, has connections throughout the entire body. So all of our vital organs, all of our muscles, all of our bones, every cell of our body links to that place. So when that gets activated, every cell gets energized with exactly what's needed to do the job. So it's a very powerful part of the brain. It's very primitive, though, and that's how they call it, because we have this in common with reptiles. So sometimes they call it a reptilian brain. The fact that you all came back to your tables and you sat in the same seat, they would say, that's your reptilian brain nesting you, making you feel comfort and certainty. And as long as you feel that, it gets quiet, and the other parts of the brain can wake up and do their job. So your reptilian brain is getting looked after this morning. But when that baby is born, the uh, interior middle part of the brain is only partially formed. And that interior part, it's as if um, this green cap I've just closed in my fist here. Approximately where that green cap is, is the part we're talking about. It, it exists in the middle, wrapped up you know, with the rest of the brain around it and it goes across to both sides, the left and the right, through a little tunnel right, that connects it. So this part of the brain develops, as soon as the baby is born, it goes into high gear. But it'll go into high gear if the survivor brain is being comforted. 
So as soon as the caretaker or the caretakers do some caring things toward that infant, survivor brain relaxes and that middle brain starts flourishing. In fact, this will even happen in the womb and they can see that when a pregnant mom tunes into the baby and does anything like um, appreciating this baby, anything like saying, oh, I can't wait to meet you. I'm so loving that I'm going to be your mom. In those kinds of moments, that emotional brain just fires, right? It's already getting signals uh, from the mother. But once it's out on its own, it starts needing people, multiple people, in fact. The more people, the better. Not just mom, right? That book, Mothers and Others, you know, really demonstrates for us multiple caregivers trumps the single caregiver, right? In fact, uh, if there are caregivers who more relate to this baby than the mom or the dad, those caregivers should be in there doing the job because the baby and them resonate. And that's where brain development really blossoms. Some cultures, they wait for this period for the baby actually to choose who's going to be the caregiver by seeing how the baby relates to different people. So the emotional brain, this is what's happening now. The emotional brain is starting to get more sophisticated. Initially, it's very basic. So the baby feels a little bit of discomfort. It sends a signal back to the survivor brain to do something to help survival. So the baby feels a little bit hungry. Survival brain does what? Cry. <laughs> OK? <laughs> and perfect communication. The emotional brain had a sensation, sent a signal to the survivor brain. Survivor brain goes into action. And it's very selective action. It cries in such a way that it brings caregivers to it. It's proximity seeking, they call it. The baby is putting out a call. I need something. In fact, caregivers, after a while, will recognize the different cries. Oh, he's tired. Oh, she's hungry. Oh, they you know, want to be picked up. Because the cries are starting to get more sophisticated. The emotional brain and the survivor brain are teaming up to get the job done. But as if this developing brain is very lucky, over the course of that first year or so, this next brain starts developing. In the, behind the forehead, behind the brow, we call it the prefrontal cortex, the outer layer of the brain behind the forehead. Now that part of the brain is really important uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, for one, it's a place where this baby is going to start thinking. Now, the thinking, again, could be very basic initially. They're just trying to size up, you know, um, the situation and come up with a conclusion about how to be. But then it gets more elaborate because at the same time, the baby is starting to pick up language. And so no language and thinking start working together. And the baby increasingly will be thinking and identifying words and then eventually saying sentences. And in this healthy brain development, eventually this part of the brain can become sort of uh, the primary part of the brain that controls everything about us. And just as we said earlier, while you're all sitting here, if you have the urge to light up a cigarette, you're you know, feeling that urge in your emotional brain. You can almost taste it and feel it in your survivor brain and your body. But your thinking brain is saying, oh, no, not a good idea. You know, why don't you wait? And in fact, you could postpone in the interest of some larger purpose what that emotional brain and survivor brain are urging you to do. So when we are functioning at our best, we say that this part of our brain really has executive control over things. Well, let me go back to that example. So you have this urge for a smoke, or you have an urge to take off your clothes, something. 
and that urge is coming from your emotion and survivor brain, but the executive brain is sort of observing and listening in. And going, what are they talking about? You know, uh-uh, not a good idea. You know, and therefore you're not going to do that, right? Now that's a very healthy brain that's able to do that. But what happens for a traumatic brain, a brain that's been traumatized, even a single trauma? We said that danger looms. The danger escalates to threat. The threat, you first start to engage. You can't engage and an automatic reaction shoots you into that sympathetic mode. If that fails, you shoot down to that parasympathetic mode. That's all happening automatically. And the place that that's happening is between these two brains. Your emotional brain and your survivor brain are talking to each other. And they're figuring out in, in some non-thinking way what you have to do, like fight or run or pass out. Now, that happens even with a single trauma. Now, if that's happening during trauma, so much blood flow is going to those two brain parts. So much wiring is being fired between these two brain parts that the thinking brain takes a back seat. In fact, the blood flow stops in the thinking brain, the electrical activity stops in the thinking brain, and all of the energy goes down to this network of communication. Now, if that only happens one time, this strong connection is going to get the person through the trauma, and then as soon as they feel safety, the survivor brain starts relaxing a little bit, letting go of its grip, and the emotional brain starts quieting a little bit, feeling more comfortable, and the thinking brain comes back online. That would be the ideal thing following a traumatic event or a critical incident, even if you're involved in one. You know, you show up on the scene and, yeah, my God, what am I dealing with? You may be an emotional and survivor brain there for a while, but after you achieve some safety, get away from the scene, touch base with a colleague, debrief a little bit. Something happens that that survivor brain relaxes. The emotional brain then lets go of the bond, and the thinking brain kicks back in again, and you're back to that optimal zone. Now, if you're not so fortunate, if instead of one trauma, as we were showing in those other illustrations, there's multiple traumas, Every time that traumatic experience occurs, th these two parts fire together. The survivor brain and the emotional brain, they, they are neuro, neuroelectrically firing together. And the principle in neuroanatomy is if when parts fire together, they wire together so that there's an increasing bond between the survivor brain and the emotional brain the more trauma one experiences, or the more severe the trauma. So a trauma survivor's brain will look very much different. It will have this sort of dominance of survival and emotional brain and a passivity with the thinking brain. Now, so what does this mean? Uh, so Billy's sitting in class, and this is Billy now, and he's got survivor brain and emotional brain calling the shots. Thinking brain is in the back seat. As the teacher comes closer and the voice is getting louder, emotional brain signals danger. Survivor brain says, fight back or run away or go numb. And his thinking brain is not saying, oh, wait a minute, that's just the teacher. That's not my father coming to wallop me again. His thinking brain is not engaged in this decision making. Right? So he goes around in life where every potential threat is like the old threat. 
every potential danger reinforces that survivor and emotional brain connection and he reacts that way and afterwards we say why did he do that wasn't he thinking <laughs> right like he wasn't using his head well that's true he wasn't thinking he wasn't using his head we mean his thinking part of his head he was in fact doing what he habitually learned to do to survive so, one of the challenges is, if this is our client, how do we break through this? Right? I maintain that you have some natural ways you do it, but I just want to validate those. Because one of the first things you do, and I've heard you talk about it today, is you come close to this client you're trying to hold your wholeness there. So in some sense, even your energy is about balance and integrity and wholeness. Right? They're all fragmented and their brain is all lopsided. But the very first thing you do is you try to help them to feel safe. No matter how you do it, how you describe that, or what tools and techniques you do, that's your first approach. You're trying to ensure their safety as best you can, whether that's their physical safety, their emotional safety, their real life safety, you're trying to ensure that. If you do that, that reptilian brain starts to relax. It lets go of its grip a little bit on the emotional brain and then you move in with some kindness, some caring, some compassion, some empathy, some positive relational exchange and the emotional brain goes, ah. So in a very short time, you can help to keep that part of the brain from taking over. If instead you came upon the scene and you didn't think about safety, you just barged in and did intrusive things and you did something like collecting all those papers and walking out the room with it, you know, if in some way you violated people's boundaries, people's sense of you know, where they begin and you end, so to speak, if you violate that, then you lock them in that zone and you're not going to get anywhere I don't care what brilliant things you say to them about who you are and how you've come to help and these are the pamphlets you should read all of those things they're not there their their thinking brain is not available to you until you've done that other work so don't minimize those early tasks of safety building relationship Safety, building relationship. You do that, you do that, you do that until you get a sense you can move on to the prefrontal brain. Now, I know we have limited times, limited opportunity, limited everything. How are we going to do that? But I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's why we pay you the big bucks to figure that stuff out. Right? Uh, <laughs> But what I want to say to you is if when things are going wrong and you're not getting to that place where the person is available to you, start asking yourselves, are we in fact doing that basic groundwork? Are we ensuring safety? Are we building relationship before we start asking them to use their head? Even maybe before we ask them to tell much of their story or try to explain why they did what they did or what they saw when they saw it. That stuff is very prefrontal. That part of the brain wasn't fully there. Don't rush to it in your interactions with them. Now, what this person will do if left on their own is they will find something, they'll find life experiences that will further reinforce this connection because that, as we said before, feels normal. They live in that survivor and emotional response zone. 
They'll increasingly act without thinking. They won't use their executive function, which is watching them and evaluating whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. They won't especially be doing any long-term thinking. They won't say, well, if I break into this house tonight, what possible outcomes might there be? And should I reconsider this breaking and entry? They're not there, right? In your work with them, you're often, in fact, loaning them your brain for a while, right? But even when you're doing that, you've got to get that safety, get that relationship built, and then you can loan them some of your thinking. You can say, well, let's take a look at that now and see if we can figure it out. And they may not be able to do that at first, but if you can keep the safety in the relationship, they'll eventually start firing, literally, in that prefrontal zone. If we left them on their own, as Billy was left on his own, Billy is going to find a way to act in ways that just sort of fit right in with where he's at. In fact, he's going to find alcohol and drugs. And alcohol, for sure, and many classes of drugs, reinforce that survivor brain, emotional brain firing. Right? You get a physical reaction from it. You get even a neurochemical reaction from it. And you get an emotional response from it. And if you're lucky, you get numb and you don't even think about it, you know? You're just, you're just zoned, right? But it feels like it goes right to his home, right? Take this stuff in and this part of the brain gets further reinforced. So we say, okay, this person now is somewhere down the road. Billy's now 20 years old maybe and he says, I want to get better. I don't want to keep getting arrested. I want to change my life, right? And he's done that because there's been a lot of people creating safety and building relationships with them. And now he wants to start thinking about how to live a better life. And we say to Billy, well, if you're serious about that, you've got to stop the alcohol and drug use. Maybe some other guys can keep doing it, but you've had so much trauma in your life and this pathway is so tightly wound together and every time you use you're just wrapping it up even tighter that's no way to get better so if you want a motivation for getting clean and sober you got to say well I if I want to stop this pain that I say I want to stop I can't just do it and keep using but this guy has been relying on this so you can't say to him, well, stop today and tomorrow you'll be better, right? A trauma brain that's been using this as sort of self-medication, you can't just stop taking that stuff. The goal would be to stop taking that stuff, but the way to get there is by gradually diminishing the harm that you're doing to yourself with it. Abstinence is the goal for a trauma survivor who wants to get better harm reduction may be the process of getting there because you've got to be taking away that stuff while you're putting other good stuff in its place. If you don't put the other good stuff in its place, they keep going back and relapsing and there are revolving door and treatment programs and detoxes and so on. So, um, in fact, this trauma survivor is using. It will have pretty much a universal effect. There may be some unique differences, but if a person has this trauma brain and they're using alcohol and drugs, the first part that gets affected is the last part that got developed, the thinking brain. So while they're using, their thinking starts going south, right? They're not thinking clearly anymore, right? And so they're telling these wonderful jokes and stories that they think are so funny, uh, you know, and nobody's getting it, but, you know, what's wrong with them, right? Their thinking is getting cloudy. If they keep drinking, keep using, then even during that episode, the emotional brain starts getting involved. 
And so now the emotions go on a roller coaster. I love every one of you in here. You are my best buddies. What'd you say? What'd you say? I'm gonna fight. <laughs> <laughs> I should have picked a smaller person. <laughs> but my thinking brain's not working, you know, so I'm going to make a mistake like that. <laughs> Pick a fight with a big guy. Okay? And then, if you keep using, even in that episode, then his physical brain, the first part to get developed, starts getting affected. So now balance, coordination, you know, all starts going. So in a single episode, a trauma brain goes three, two, one in its effect. And that's how they can tell how much a person's been drinking, really. When the cop stops you on the side of the road, he doesn't ask you to do a Sudoku puzzle. You know? <laughs> right? He gives you some physical things to do, right? Because you can't do those. Brain one's been hit already. <laughs> but in the course of one's life of using, that's where we see the progression of deterioration. We see that their thinking becomes less and less clear, more and more confused. That thinking brain is less and less available. They're killing off more and more cells. We then see their emotional self gets more and more impacted. Their social relationships get more and more impacted. And if they continue that lifestyle over the course of time, their survivor brain starts falling apart and they get sick or even die. 